but they are fierce and will stop at nothing in their bid to secure domination and supremacy of the Western Mediterranean. Who are these warriors and who are they fighting for? They come from the central coast of the Tyrrhenian Sea, part of the Mediterranean, off the coast of Italy, a land now known as Tuscany, the cradle of the fascinating Etruscan civilization. The origins and language of the mysterious Etruscans are subjects of debate for scholars today, perhaps because there seems to be no lineage. The negligible remains of the people of Etruria have nothing to do with the pyramids, temples, or other vestiges of ancient Egypt, and it's impossible to make a comparison with the Greeks, who left us with incomparable works of art like the Parthenon. And the Romans, they came later, but though the origins of the Etruscans are unknown, we have discovered a lot about Etruscan culture from findings and archaeological digs in the Tuscany countryside. In the 6th century BC, Rome was still far from being the great capital of the world. In reality, during that time, the city was under the dominion and influence of the Etruscans. In fact, several kings of Rome were of Etruscan origin. While ruling Rome, the Etruscans built the architecturally accomplished Cloaca Maxima, a huge drain that conveyed sewage from quarters near the Roman Forum into the Tiber River. The influence of the Etruscans reached as far as Pompeii, and their fleets threatened Greek and Phoenician settlements on Sardinia and Corsica and on the Côte d'Azur. Still, everyone wanted to trade with the Etruscans because they were rich. They loved beautiful things and bought jewels, weapons, exotic objects, and pottery. One of the repositories for Etruscan culture is an ancient town called Merlo on the banks of the Umbroni River in the Siena province of Italy, the middle of the Etruscan nation. Nothing remains of the ancient town but on a plateau called Poggio Civitate, just outside the city, are clues to what Etruscan homes were like. Though these cities were destroyed and rebuilt by Roman invaders, evidence of the Etruscan civilization has turned up in tombs and necropolises, cemeteries. In 1965, Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania sponsored an excavation led by archaeologist Kyle Meredith Phillips, Jr. at a site not far from the medieval town of Merlo. Since then, every summer, teams of American students and professional archaeologists have been working at Poggio Civitate. This archaeological campaign has unearthed a find of a huge Etruscan building from the distant past. The remains of the south wall are still in the clearing where the building was erected. The construction covered a square surface that was truly enormous, 197 feet on each side. Inside what must have been the courtyard, there are foundation walls of a so-called tempieto, or little temple, a small square-shaped building that in all likelihood contained statues of divinities and ancestors. Though little of the original building remains, it was natural for archaeologists to try to reconstruct what the building at Merlot looked like. More than 2,500 years ago, the little temple was in the middle of a big colonnaded courtyard that ran along three sides of the building. The building itself, which archaeologists called the Upper Building, was erected in 580 BC on the ruins of a previous so-called Lower Building erected in the 7th century BC 
a building that was later destroyed by fire. Archaeologists still don't know if it was the home of an important family or the meeting place of a league formed by various Etruscan cities. They found many terracotta statues on the roof, some of which had a peculiar headdress with a wide brim. The statues are called acroterii, a Greek word that indicates their position on the roofs of temples and buildings. They also unearthed ivory statuettes and precious stones that prove how wealthy the inhabitants of the building were. All the findings from the building at Poggio Civitate are now on view at the Merlot Museum set up in a home of the ancient medieval town. One striking figure is this horseman. It was on the roof of the lower building. Most of the objects in the museum collection come from this building. Part of the roof of the more recent building was reconstructed, and some of the acroterii that used to decorate it were repositioned on top. Standing out is a statue of a man with a strange hat, something a musketeer or cowboy might wear. This statue has become the symbol of Merlot. These terracotta plates show aspects of everyday life. This one depicts a banquet. At the time, the plates were decorated very colorfully. The upper-class Etruscans loved the pleasures of life. Banquets were held in elegant settings among damask cushions, candlesticks, and expensive tableware, with waiters serving and musicians livening up the atmosphere. Frescoes found in tombs at Tarquinia, a city in the north of Latium, provide us with more detailed information on the daily life of the Etruscans. Frescoes in the Tomb of the Leopards, built in the middle of the 5th century BC, also depict a banquet scene, with musicians playing and slaves working as waiters. There is a couple on every bed. Because of these frescoes, we now know that unlike Greek and Roman women, most Etruscan women used to lie beside their mates, happy to take an active part in festive banquets. This freedom was unique in the ancient world and used to shock Greek and Roman travelers at that time. Greek historian Theopompus of Chios, who was thought to have the most malicious tongue of ancient literature, wrote in the fourth century BC, Etruscan women don't feast only with their husbands, they feast with anybody. They don't mind appearing nude in public and gladly do exercises at the gym beside men. Plus, they eat and drink a lot and are really good looking. This was a privileged position compared to women of other civilizations of the ancient world. The nearly equal relationship with their husbands made women feel self-confident and proud and naturally, a woman like that loved to dress well and adorn herself with magnificent jewels. Over 3,000 Etruscan bronze mirrors still exist today. There are inscriptions on the back of the mirrors proving that in a period of widespread illiteracy, Etruscan women knew how to read and write. The area around Merlot has become famous not only for the excavations, but also for important research in the field of genetics. One of the mysteries that has engrossed historians and scholars is the disappearance of the Etruscan civilization in a short span of two centuries. We know that it was assimilated by the Romans, the new rulers of the world. The question was, were there any descendants of the Etruscans that survived the centuries? Researchers have concluded that the inhabitants of Merlot are the direct descendants of the Etruscans. The Italian Council for Scientific Research had conducted a study on the genetic heritage of Italians. It was noted that there are three genetically different areas in Italy, which correspond to precise geographic locations. The most homogeneous of these areas, the one with the highest concentration of a certain genetic type, is the area of Tuscany, 
the ancient homeland of the Etruscans, particularly the area around the town of Merlo. Genetics researchers, now working with modern DNA or genetic code techniques, are anxiously exploring whether the DNA of the inhabitants of this beautiful town corresponds to that of the otherwise extinct Etruscan people. Besides Merlot, another important commercial area of Etruria is a place called Volterra, one of the most ancient cities of Italy. Volterra's name has not changed much in almost 3,000 years. Back then it was called Velathri. Like many Etruscan towns, it occupied an easy to defend, naturally strong position on a hilltop which dominated the valleys of the Era, Elsa, and Cicinia rivers. Volterra was a flourishing town whose inhabitants lived off their craftsmanship. They became famous for their work with alabaster, a type of soft rock that is easy to carve and is plentiful there. Though there were many types of alabaster works, it was the urns that were exported to most of Italy. Modern carving of alabaster, which prospered anew in the area at the end of the 18th century, forms a perfect link between Etruscan workers and modern craftsmen. During the 4th century, a wall that was over four miles long and covered an area of nearly 290 acres surrounded the city. Although the wall was rebuilt many times during the Roman and medieval periods, there are still large sections from the Etruscan period. One would enter the town through solidly built gates, like the Diana Gate, or through the monumental Arch Gate, the lower part of which dates from the Etruscans. The Romans rebuilt the arch using Etruscan material, like the three human heads that are practically unrecognizable today. But the most substantial traces of Etruscan Volterra are found in the zone of the Acropolis, where the park of the castle is today. The area contains many archeological ruins, mostly building foundations, situated along an ancient road network of the city. Two temples used to stand in this area, built around the third century BC. The purpose of the small building, shown in close-up, is another mystery scholars have not yet managed to unravel. Heading now toward the coast, we come to another city that became famous for a totally different kind of work. It is Populonia, or Pupluna, its ancient name. Populonia is the only big Etruscan town that was built directly on the coast. It was here that Etruscans produced, processed, and traded large quantities of iron. Over the centuries, they accumulated enormous piles of slag from the work of the furnaces. Some piles were 10 to 20 feet high. These slag piles were so rich in iron, even in the unprocessed state, that in 1940 the Italian army used them to make war supplies. Scholars have estimated that there could have been 2 million tons of slag in these piles. The present town of Populonia traces its origin to more recent times. The town flourished in the latter part of the Middle Ages but iron was being refined and traded here at Populonia nearly 500 years before Christ. Where did this precious metal come from? In spite of metal-bearing chains nearby, the iron came by sea from the island of Elba. The inhabitants of Populonia were able to transport the metal and protect it from the many Phoenician and Greek pirates and rivaling Etruscan cities thanks to a powerful fleet. The citizens grew rich in a short span of time, owing to the iron trade. Merchants used to buy the raw material at Populonia and then have skilled craftsmen make weapons and pieces of armor for their leaders and warriors. The material piled up for centuries, and much of it ended up being buried in necropolises. 
It wasn't until the late 1900s that cemeteries buried for years and years, like the one at San Cerboni, were discovered. Here there are important examples of chamber or tumulus tombs. These tombs have a long access corridor that leads to a quadrangular cella. The diameter of the cylindrical tambour that covered it could be as long as 90 feet. Mighty walls defended the upper part of the city, or Acropolis, where sanctuaries and other public buildings were erected. At the time when Populonia was at the zenith of its splendor, the city walls looked like this. In the background, the outlines of the buildings on the Acropolis are silhouetted on the horizon. The iron that left Populonia would be distributed to cities throughout the Etruscan Empire, all the way to Kisri, known in Roman times as Seire, present-day Cerveteri. Cerveteri was one of the most powerful cities in South Etruria, as is proven by the wealth found in its splendid tombs. One fine example is the sepulcher at the tomb of the bas-reliefs, in the necropolis at Banditaccia. It got this name from the fact that on its walls there are reproductions of objects used in everyday life. These include a lantern or oil lamp, some cord, a wine jug, as well as some utensils and weapons. But the town considered the most important city in the area was Clusium, or Cusi, one of the few cities of the ancient world that dared to defy Rome and won at least in the early stages. Rome was only a frontier town at the peak of Etruscan splendor. Indeed, one could say it was the Etruscans who brought grandeur and a civilized way of life to Rome, and to a country that, on the whole, was rather savage at the time. Etruscan kings ruled Rome for over a hundred years. Some say it was their arrogance that spelled the end of Etruscan power. Roman historians documented the war between Rome and Clusium. According to texts, it started in 510 BC when the son of Tarquinius Superbus, a Roman king of Etruscan origin, ravished a beautiful and virtuous matron. The Roman nobles rebelled and expelled the Tarquins from their city, vowing that never again would a king rule Rome. And thus was born the glorious Roman Republic. After being ousted from Rome, Tarquinius Superbus went to Clusium and sought the help of its great king, Porcina, who headed a confederation of Etruscan cities. Porcina marched on Rome in 508 BC, winning many victories before being turned back by Horatius at the banks of the Tiber River. The figure of Porcina is shrouded in legend and mystery, like the grave where he is thought to be buried. Scientists and adventurers have been searching for years in the countryside around Clusium for the mythical mausoleum where the body of Porcina was laid to rest with fabulous treasures 2,500 years ago. However, despite the many attempts, the tomb has never been found. Pliny the Elder mentions Porcina's tomb in a text. After hearing the many stories that were being told during his lifetime, he imagined it as a grand, square-shaped construction, measuring 300 feet on each side, that was several stories high and supported by very high pyramids. Inside the square base, there must have been a labyrinth of tunnels where the treasures were hidden. It's possible that Pliny got carried away with his description, because it's hard to believe that a monument of this size has vanished completely. Another secret about Etruscan civilization that has only been partly unveiled concerns the language. This is the alphabet reproduced on a very particular primer shaped like a cockerel. Quite a few scholars believe that Etruscan is a very ancient language that may even have existed before Greek and Latin. The problem in figuring out the language of the Etruscans stems from the mystery over their origins. According to the Greek historian Herodotus, who lived in the 5th century BC, the Etruscans were originally from Lydia, 
an ancient region in present-day Turkey, and sailed to the Italian coast from there. But according to another theory by the Greek historian Dionysius of Halicarnassus, on which many modern scholars agree, the Etruscans were an indigenous people who came from a territory that includes present-day Tuscany, part of Latium and Emilia. The most antique evidence dates from the 10th to the 7th centuries BC and is found in a zone that we rarely think about as having connections with the Etruscans. This place is Felsina, or present-day Bologna. Artifacts from Villanova are housed in Bologna at the Civic Archaeological Museum, which was opened in 1881. It is a unique collection, the only one of its kind in the world. In the 9th century BC, it was here that the so-called Villanovan culture flourished, named after Villanova, a town near Bologna, where archaeologists discovered a group of tombs attributed to this culture. Many scholars believe the inhabitants of Villanova may have been the ancestors of the Etruscans. In these tombs, the deceased were cremated and the ashes kept in ossuaries or urns, biconical shaped vases covered with an upturned bowl. This specimen dates from the 9th century BC. The urn was put in a hole in the ground lined with pebbles. Sometimes the earth was kept back by stone slabs. Personal items were also put into the tomb, either directly in the ossuary or beside it. Items like fibulae, used more as ornaments than to fasten garments. There might have been a sharpened razor in bronze. The presence of razors in almost all men's graves leads us to believe that unlike the Greeks, Etruscan men preferred to have clean-shaven faces. An axe blade, also in bronze, used both as an implement and as a weapon, would also have been included. In women's graves, they also found fibulae, often decorated with swastikas or of the twisted arch type. But there would also be humble objects, like whorls, which were weights put at the end of the spindle, and naturally, thread spools. Also included would be armillas, bronze bracelets, and some pearls and amber pendants that were perhaps tied to each other to make a necklace. D. H. Lawrence said that to the Etruscan, all was alive. Indeed, from frescoes found in tombs, it is evident that the Etruscans were an active people. They loved public spectacles, performances in the square, and athletic competitions. They loved to go hunting and fishing, but also appreciated music and big banquets. The stature they gave women made them unique among ancient civilizations. But after they were driven from Rome, the Etruscans never regained prominence. By 280 BC, all Etruscan cities had either surrendered or died under Rome's sword. In a land they had enriched, now only their tombs survive and nearly all that we know about their way of life comes from their way of death. Mysteries about the land of Etruria can now only be solved from secrets buried in the depths of the earth. The eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea, Anatolia, called Asia Minor, or present-day Turkey, the year 1200 BC. Rubble and ruins are all that remain of the city of Hadashash, the once magnificent capital of the Hittites, one of the strongest civilizations in the ancient world. Warriors known only as peoples of the sea, whose origin is unknown, are responsible for the destruction. Their armies move on, conquering Syria and threatening Egypt. Pharaoh Ramses III of the 12th dynasty said, no country managed to put up resistance to their armies. States suddenly disappeared, and in a moment they were all destroyed. After almost a thousand years of splendor, silence fell on the Anatolian highlands. 
citizens of a once great civilization disbanded to the countryside, leaving ruins of great cities to be buried for thousands of years. An important testament to the power of the Hittite Empire before its demise is preserved in Egypt, a land that was once its enemy. The two pillars at the entrance to the Temple of Luxor on the Nile are adorned with scenes of the battle fought between the Hittites and the Egyptians in 1295 BC at Kadesh in Syria. The great Ramses II, the warrior Pharaoh, is seen fighting from his chariot and leaving behind victims among the ranks of the Hittite army led by King Muwatalas. Who won this epic conflict? In this bas-relief at Luxor, the Egyptians claimed a triumphant victory. This version of the facts was never disputed until archaeological excavations in the first decades of the 20th century uncovered some ancient Hittite cities. Over 10,000 clay tablets engraved with cuneiform characters came to light in buildings at Hattashash, the capital of the empire. One of these tablets, preserved at the Archaeology Museum in Istanbul, bears the inscription, Kadesh Peace Treaty. The treaty lays down conditions imposed on the Egyptians, including one to retreat inside their borders. So more than 3,000 years after the event, thanks to this tablet, we now know that it was the Hittites and not the Egyptians who really won that conflict. Over the centuries, Asia Minor has seen numerous civilizations flourish. After the Hittites, the country reached a high civil and cultural level thanks to populations of Greeks who had settled along its coasts. Later on, during the period of Roman rule, Asia Minor became one of the richest provinces of the empire. Turkey was also the cradle of the great Byzantine Empire, an evolution of the equally famous Eastern Roman Empire. We will journey back in time, starting in the 6th century AD, and explore the great civilizations that flourished on the Turkish coasts and highlands. Ankara is currently the capital of Turkey, but for centuries the real capital of this part of the world was Byzantium, later called Constantinople, then renamed Istanbul. Byzantium was full of dazzling monuments. One of them was the Karnak Obelisk, erected at the city's famous circus grounds in the first half of the 5th century AD. At the front of the base, there are portrayals of family members of Emperor Theodosius II, along with court dignitaries, watching circus chariot races from an elevated stand. On one of the sides, there is a depiction of the transport and erection of the obelisk itself. For centuries, Byzantium, or Constantinople, was the preeminent city of the entire Byzantine Empire. It boasted a modern plan and many infrastructures. At the Hippodrome is the Basilican Cistern, a gigantic underground tank constructed perhaps early in the 4th century AD by Emperor Constantine. Its name derives from the fact that it was enlarged using the uncovered area of a nearby basilica. What is exceptional 
is its 336 columns, all supporting the masonry vault. But certainly the most famous building of 6th century Byzantium is the Church of St. Sophia, or Dome of Hagi Sophia, rebuilt as it appears today by Emperor Justinian. Its original appearance was altered after the Ottomans invaded the city. The church was turned into a mosque and four characteristic minarets were added. Beautiful Byzantine mosaics covered with plaster in 1700 were brought to light in the 20th century when the mosque was turned into the Hagia Sophia or Hagi Sophia Museum. Saint Sophia was known as the incarnation of divine wisdom. Praying to her in this divine basilica must have filled thousands of visitors over the years with a sense of spirituality and grace. In the southwestern part of Turkey is the city of Aphrodisias, dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite, or Venus to the Romans. Founded in the 5th century BC, Aphrodisias became very important during the Greek-Roman era. Worship of the goddess at the sanctuary here spread throughout the Mediterranean area. Important archaeological discoveries have been made here since the 1960s. One of the most stunning sites is this gigantic stadium. Erected in the first century AD, it was over 850 feet long, and its original seats are still intact, arranged neatly in 30 rows. It is one of the world's best preserved ancient stadiums. In the middle of Aphrodisia stood the Agora, a rectangular market area surrounded on three sides by marvelous colonnades. The columns were surmounted by decorated capitals and architraves, which can now be seen in the garden of the Aphrodisias Museum. The theater here, which dates back to the end of the second century AD, is also in a superb state of preservation. It has a capacity of 10,000 spectators. Built by Julius Zolios, it was dedicated to Aphrodite and the city. Zolios was a native of Aphrodisias and a former slave of Emperor Augustus. He did the city a very important service by having it obtain the special status of autonomous city exempt from taxes. The most sacred site in the city, of course, was the Sanctuary of Aphrodite. This is the Tetrapylon, the gateway to the sanctuary. The Tetrapylon was originally composed of four rows of four columns each. Many of the spiral fluted columns are still standing with their gables still in place. Today, the Tetrapylon is an isolated monument, but in ancient times, a compound and a road connected it with the Temple of Aphrodite. The temple itself was rebuilt in the first century BC with eight columns on the short sides and 15 on the long sides. The sanctuary was famous in ancient times for the practice of sacred prostitution that had its roots in ancient fertility and reproduction rites. During the Christian Byzantine period, however, to help the population forget these pagan practices, the Temple of Aphrodite was turned into a church and Aphrodisias was renamed Stavropolis, meaning City of the Cross. Not far from Aphrodisias lies the present-day center of Parmukale, famous for its natural cliffs that are formed by basins of limestone arranged on sloping white terraces. Parmukale is the site of ancient Hierapolis, founded by the king of Pergamum in 190 BC. It was destroyed and rebuilt several times and reached the height of its development between the second and third centuries AD when it was inhabited by Greeks, Romans, and Jews. 
By the 6th century in the Christian era, the city had become a bishopric. However, this did not prevent people from continuing to worship Pluto, the great pagan god of the underworld. Pluto's realm, the House of Hades, or Kingdom of the Dead, was thought to be located beneath the earth. Worshippers, part of a thonic cult, perhaps thought the god had access to the Kingdom of the Dead somewhere under the ground at Hierapolis. In the 6th century, a monumental colonnaded road that was nearly one mile long and 43 feet wide crossed the city. Near the colonnaded street, there was a central fountain and a pond containing water believed to have healing properties. It's now been turned into a swimming pool for tourists. The theater built in the second century AD is in such good shape it could probably be used today. Since 1957, Italian archaeologists have been bringing to light the cavia, 26 magnificent tiers of seating, along with marble reliefs that recount the myths of Apollo and Artemis. The cemetery of the city extended beyond the Byzantine walls. More than a thousand tombs have been discovered here. In the center of the ancient city, however, is probably where the so-called Plutonium, or Sanctuary of Pluto, was erected. It is believed by some that the sanctuary was completely underground, most likely in this cave that in ancient times was called the Cave of the Underworld and the Demons. An ancient traveler wrote, every animal that goes into the cave dies at once. In reality, there could have been poisonous gases circulating in the cave. How then did the priests freely enter and leave the grotto? They probably realized that the toxic substance was heavier than air and settled at the bottom of the cave. It was therefore only harmful to small animals who wandered that far. Naturally, only select Pluto worshippers were in on this secret. Another fascinating locale in ancient times was Gordium, or Alisar Huyuk, roughly 50 miles from Ankara. Gordium was the capital of Phrygia, an ancient region of Anatolia that was named after the Phrygians, the people who lived there from approximately 1200 BC. The Phrygians are believed to be one of the peoples of the sea, responsible for destroying the Hittite Empire. Originally from Thrace, a region at the easternmost tip of the Balkan Peninsula, the Phrygians reached the height of their power around the 8th century BC. Archaeologists have found the remains of the city walls of Gordium and Megarons, the great halls that belong to the complex of the royal palace and stand out for their size. Excavations have also uncovered decorative elements and furnishings, now preserved at the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara. But one of the greatest discoveries concerned the first great king of Phrygia, the mythical and legendary King Midas. It was said that Dionysius gave him the power to turn everything he touched into gold. In 1949, an American archaeological expedition discovered his tomb, thereby turning a mythical personality into a historical figure. The tomb was 820 feet in diameter and 174 feet high. To access the burial chamber, archaeologists had to dig a 230-foot-long tunnel. They ended up in a spacious hall measuring 20 by 17 feet that was entirely wood paneled. This is the tomb of King Midas, rebuilt at the Ankara Museum. The corpse was laid on a wooden bed, and bone analysis has proven that at the time of death, the man was about 60 years old and slightly over five feet tall. Working from the skull that was found, this is what King Midas would have looked like. His burial kit included tripods, bronze basins, 
caskets, and other objects. But strangely enough, for the tomb of the legendary King Midas, there was not even one gold item. Moving further east, we come to the ruins of the great city of the Hittite Empire in the heart of the Anatolian highlands, Hattashash, present-day Boakoi. The Hittites were a people of Indo-European origin who arrived there around the end of the third millennium BC from regions situated north of the Black Sea. Deciphering the tablets of the Hattashash archives has revealed aspects of the social and political life of the Hittites as well as the triumphs of their kings and armies. Though most of the significant traces of this ancient civilization have disappeared, one strong archaeological find remains. The Great Hittite Sanctuary at Yazilikia, near Hattashash, erected in 1400 BC. The sanctuary was thought to have been inhabited by wicked pagan gods. Today, it yields incredible evidence of the Hittite civilization. The sanctuary is composed of two environments dug into a 40-foot-high block of rock that archaeologists have divided into Chamber A and Chamber B. Both rooms are decorated with bas-reliefs sculpted on the bare walls. Chamber A contains a depiction of two processions. One is mostly composed of male figures, the other procession, composed of female figures, is headed by a divinity, probably the sun goddess, Hepat. Not far away, a small entrance flanked by two demons with the body of a lion leads to Chamber B, measuring 60 feet by 10 feet. Twelve figures with similar garments and bearing stand out on one wall. There is also a representation of a gigantic sword more than 10 feet high, illustrated as if it is penetrating the rock. The heads of four lions form the handle, with a human head at the top. What could this design have meant? The mystery was unraveled by a description found in a Hittite ritual text. The sword is a symbol of Nurgle, the dreaded god of pestilence and the underworld, often depicted by multi-headed lions. Likewise, the discovery of bird skeletons here, creatures that were traditionally sacrificed to underground deities, convinced scholars that the room was used for worshipping the dead. Yazilikia managed to survive the many wars that engulfed the Hittite Empire, unlike Hattashash, which was destroyed and rebuilt several times. The oldest evidence of dwellings here dates as far back as the end of the third millennium BC, but the layout for the real town seems to have been developed around 1650 BC. Hattashash was built on three levels, an upper city, the citadel or acropolis, a lower city, completely surrounded by walls that took advantage of the rocky nature of the land, and a 4,000 foot high plateau surrounded by steep walls and rocky gorges. The walls formed a circuit that was about three and a half miles long. Above an earth bulwark, 30 feet high, they had erected crenellated walls alternated with mighty rectangular towers. This discovery allowed archaeologists to understand how the wall was made. It was only one of a treasure trove of finds in the area. Archaeologists also found the so-called Royal Gate, or Gate of the Kings. Two towers flanked the gateway, and bronze-plated gates probably provided additional defense. Two great statues of the war god dominated the entrance hall. This is a copy. The original is at the Ankara Museum. Beneath another gate, the Sphinx Gate, there was an entrance formed by a 260-foot-long tunnel, which was probably shut off at each end by huge doors. Only after a long walk in the dark did visitors reach the bright sunlight of the city. To the west, there was the Lion Gate. 
two lions sculpted on the jams with menacing wide open jaws, the symbolic guardians of the city. From the excavations, it appears there was no specific city plan. The streets must have been winding and haphazard. In the upper city, archaeologists found many buildings that they've identified as temples. The huge stones making up the construction are perfectly aligned without any spaces between them, a method also utilized by the Incas in South America thousands of years later. In the lower city, probably the most ancient part of the settlement, stood the great sacred complex archaeologists identified as Temple One. It is a square-shaped urban area that is roughly 980 feet on each side and cut in two by a stately paved street. King Hattusili III had it built around the middle of the 13th century BC. Here they worshiped the sacred couple formed by Hati, the weather god, and Arena, the sun goddess. The many rooms surrounding the temple, characterized by enormous aligned jars, were probably necessary for the sanctuary's elaborate religious rites and festivals that were put on before very large crowds. An overhanging rock, now called by the Turkish name of Bulukale, dominated the city. Bulukale was the Acropolis, or citadel, and was the site of the king's residence. It was a natural fortress, a plateau measuring 650 by 500 feet, and every inch of space was utilized. With the gates, the towers, the walls, buildings, and royal palace, the citadel was a formidable site. The structures were of many shapes and sizes, and were generally planned to face a courtyard, The walls were crenellated, meaning they were notched for battlements, and all around there were towers to add to the defense. The purposes of all the different buildings have not been discovered. Naturally, some were used as living spaces, some seemed to be auditoriums, others had religious functions. But the capacity of the citadel was immense. According to an inscription on one of the tablets, a king of Hadashash, after returning from a military expedition, managed to lock up as many as 3,330 prisoners in the royal palace. So what happened to the Hittites? Once their cities were destroyed, they apparently just scattered throughout the countryside. After the Hittites, Hundreds of different armies and peoples settled in or simply passed through the regions of the Anatolian highlands. Centrally located, it was a focal point for passage east and west. An ancient poem about the people who lived in this region says, We are what we've been. A thousand faces have preceded us, and those faces are still found in a thousand glances. Archaeologists still don't know if it was the home of an important family or the meeting place of a league formed by various Etruscan cities. They found many terracotta statues on the roof, some of which had a peculiar headdress with a wide brim. The statues are called acroterii, a Greek word that indicates their position on the roofs of temples and buildings. They also unearthed ivory statuettes and precious stones that prove how wealthy the inhabitants of the building were. All the findings from the building at Poggio Civitate are now on view at the Merlot Museum set up in a home of the ancient medieval town. One striking figure is this horseman. It was on the roof of the lower building. 
most of the objects in the museum collection come from this building. Part of the roof of the more recent building was reconstructed, and some of the acroterii that used to decorate it were repositioned on top. Standing out is a statue of a man with a strange hat, something a musketeer or cowboy might wear. This statue has become the symbol of Merlot. These terracotta plates show aspects of everyday life. This one depicts a banquet. At the time, the plates were decorated very colorfully. The upper-class Etruscans loved the pleasures of life. Banquets were held in elegant settings among damask cushions, candlesticks, and expensive tableware, with waiters serving and musicians livening up the atmosphere. Frescoes found in tombs at Tarquinia, a city in the north of Latium, provide us with more detailed information on the daily life of the Etruscans. Frescoes in the Tomb of the Leopards, built in the middle of the 5th century BC, also depict a banquet scene, with musicians playing and slaves working as waiters. There is a couple on every bed. Because of these frescoes, we now know that unlike Greek and Roman women, most Etruscan women used to lie beside their mates, happy to take an active part in festive banquets. This freedom was unique in the ancient world and used to shock Greek and Roman travelers at that time. Greek historian Theopompus of Chios, who was thought to have the most malicious tongue of ancient literature, wrote in the fourth century BC, Etruscan women don't feast only with their husbands, they feast with anybody. They don't mind appearing nude in public and gladly do exercises at the gym beside men. Plus, they eat and drink a lot and are really good looking. This was a privileged position compared to women of other civilizations of the ancient world. The nearly equal relationship with their husbands made women feel self-confident and proud and naturally, a woman like that loved to dress well and adorn herself with magnificent jewels. Over 3,000 Etruscan bronze mirrors still exist today. There are inscriptions on the back of the mirrors proving that in a period of widespread illiteracy, Etruscan women knew how to read and write. The area around Merlot has become famous not only for the excavations, but also for important research in the field of genetics. One of the mysteries that has engrossed historians and scholars is the disappearance of the Etruscan civilization in a short span of two centuries. We know that it was assimilated by the Romans, the new rulers of the world. The question was, were there any descendants of the Etruscans that survived the centuries? Researchers have concluded that the inhabitants of Merlot are the direct descendants of the Etruscans. The Italian Council for Scientific Research had conducted a study on the genetic heritage of Italians. It was noted that there are three genetically different areas in Italy, which correspond to precise geographic locations. The most homogeneous of these areas, the one with the highest concentration of a certain genetic type, is the area of Tuscany, the ancient homeland of the Etruscans, particularly the area around the town of Merlot. Genetics researchers, now working with modern DNA or genetic code techniques, are anxiously exploring whether the DNA of the inhabitants of this beautiful town corresponds to that of the otherwise extinct Etruscan people. Besides Merlot, another important commercial area of Etruria is a place called Volterra, one of the most ancient cities of Italy. Volterra's name has not changed much in almost 3,000 years. Back then it was called Velathri. Like many Etruscan towns, it occupied an easy to defend, naturally strong position on a hilltop, which dominated the valleys of the Era, Elsa, and Cicinia rivers. 
Volterra was a flourishing town whose inhabitants lived off their craftsmanship. They became famous for their work with alabaster, a type of soft rock that is easy to carve and is plentiful there. Though there were many types of alabaster works, it was the urns that were exported to most of Italy. Modern carving of alabaster, which prospered anew in the area at the end of the 18th century, forms a perfect link between Etruscan workers and modern craftsmen. During the 4th century, a wall that was over four miles long and covered an area of nearly 290 acres surrounded the city. Although the wall was rebuilt many times during the Roman and medieval periods, there are still large sections from the Etruscan period. One would enter the town through solidly built gates, like the Diana Gate, or through the monumental Arch Gate, the lower part of which dates from the Etruscans. The Romans rebuilt the arch using Etruscan material, like the three human heads that are practically unrecognizable today. But the most substantial traces of Etruscan Volterra are found in the zone of the Acropolis, where the park of the castle is today. The area contains many archaeological ruins, mostly building foundations, situated along an ancient road network of the city. Two temples used to stand in this area, built around the third century BC. The purpose of the small building, shown in close-up, is another mystery scholars have not yet managed to unravel. Heading now toward the coast, we come to another city that became famous for a totally different kind of work. It is Populonia, or Pupluna, its ancient name. Populonia is the only big Etruscan town that was built directly on the coasters near the Roman Forum into the Tiber River. The influence of the Etruscans reached as far as Pompeii and their fleets threatened Greek and Phoenician settlements on Sardinia and Corsica and on the Côte d'Azur. Still, everyone wanted to trade with the Etruscans because they were rich. They loved beautiful things and bought jewels, weapons, exotic objects and pottery. One of the repositories for Etruscan culture is an ancient town called Merlo on the banks of the Umbroni River in the Siena province of Italy, the middle of the Etruscan nation. Nothing remains of the ancient town, but on a plateau called Poggio Civitate, just outside the city, are clues to what Etruscan homes were like. Though these cities were destroyed and rebuilt by Roman invaders, Evidence of the Etruscan civilization has turned up in tombs and necropolises, cemeteries. In 1965, Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania sponsored an excavation led by archaeologist Kyle Meredith Phillips, Jr. at a site not far from the medieval town of Merlo. Since then, every summer, teams of American students and professional archaeologists have been working at Poggio Civitate, this archaeological campaign has unearthed a find of a huge Etruscan building from the distant past. The remains of the south wall are still in the clearing where the building was erected. The construction covered a square surface that was truly enormous, 197 feet on each side. Inside what must have been the courtyard, there are foundation walls of a so-called tempieto, or little temple, a small square-shaped building that in all likelihood contained statues of divinities and ancestors. Though little of the original building remains, it was natural for archaeologists to try to reconstruct what the building at Merlo looked like. More than 2,500 years ago, the little temple was in the middle of a big colonnaded courtyard that ran along three sides of the building. The building itself, which archaeologists called the upper building, 
was erected in 580 BC on the ruins of a previous so-called lower building erected in the 7th century BC, a building that was later destroyed by fire. Italy, 540 BC, the height of the Etruscan civilization. The mighty Greek fleet suffers a devastating defeat in the naval battle of Alalia off the coast of Corsica. The Greeks fight courageously, but are no match for a ruthless and extremely determined enemy. The victors aren't soldiers of a unified nation, but they are fierce and will stop at nothing in their bid to secure domination and supremacy of the Western Mediterranean. Who are these warriors and who are they fighting for? They come from the central coast of the Tyrrhenian Sea, part of the Mediterranean, off the coast of Italy, a land now known as Tuscany, the cradle of the fascinating Etruscan civilization. The origins and language of the mysterious Etruscans are subjects of debate for scholars today, perhaps because there seems to be no lineage. The negligible remains of the people of Etruria have nothing to do with the pyramids, temples, or other vestiges of ancient Egypt, and it's impossible to make a comparison with the Greeks, who left us with incomparable works of art like the Parthenon, 